Hello. I'm very sorry not to be able to join you in person, but I do hope you're all having a lovely time as always in Goa. Today, my topic is trying to make sense of today's complex market. So I'm going to begin right now with the soybean oil market. A lot has been happening in it, so I thought that was a good one to begin with. This slide is focusing on the US market because of the impact being made by US biodiesel demand. A lot of attention, part of it driven by what's going on in California with its low carbon fuel standard. In the early panic over shortage of feedstocks for the growth in US biodiesel, you can see in the left slide how the share of soybean oil in the combined oil and meal revenues using CBOT as a guide, the share of soy oil nearly reached 50%. That's the blue line. It's actually fallen back very recently, but we are starting to see US getting closer to India, where soybeans are seen as an oil rather than a meal crop in terms of value. And one of the things that has gone on in the background is that US soy oil became for a while increasingly uncompetitive in the export arena. The right diagram plots in dollars per ton the basis for FOB Argentine soy oil, the world major exporter, compared with domestic prices, the CBOT first position inside the US. And you could see that at a certain point about two, three months ago, US oil became domestically $300 more expensive than FOB Argentine oil, making US exports completely unviable. Now, Argentine exports have suffered from shallow river draft, poor crop, but things have got back a bit more to normal. But even so, I think that the US is going in future to be less and less of a player in the soy oil export market. Inside the US, one of the consequences of President Biden's election was a belief that there would be a greater support for biodiesel mandates and that the EPA would not give many waivers. Therefore, what are called RINs, the tradable certificates for biodiesel mandates, the value of RINs shown in the right diagram, soared. You can see how they've risen. And in the same diagram, the blue line measured on the right measures the value of RINs in cents per pound of soy oil. And we can see if you turn it into dollars per ton, the value of the mandate for soy oil in the US is currently about $650 a ton. It went up as high as nearly $900. On top of that, don't forget, there's the equivalent of a $300 blending tax credit. So altogether, there are a lot of incentives for biodiesel. But if we look at the left, what we can see is in the last few months, there's been a kind of plateau in the demand for soy oil in biofuels. What we plot there in black, measured on the right, is inedible use of soy oil in the US. Green is food oil measured on the left axis. And while food oil use has gen generally recovered strongly from COVID, biofuel demand, somewhat surprisingly, has actually fallen in the last month or so. And it has settled at the high level it touched just before COVID struck. What I think is happening is that other waste feedstocks 
are being favored where possible, where it's available over vegetable oil, because the Californian system gives incentives for their use. Let's turn now to sun oil. It offers clearly some hope to hard pressed importers. In these two diagrams, the green bars, the histograms, are combined output measured on the left of sunflower seed in Ukraine and Russia by crop year. And you'll see it's recovered well this year, but even so, it's still slightly below where it was back in 2019-20. Now, the recovery should allow a bit of a breathing space for importers in India to benefit from the cut in import tariffs that the government announced. And if you look at these diagrams, the left shows you the sun oil premium over palm oil in Europe, measured on the right hand axis. The right diagram is the sun oil premium over soy oil, which actually goes to a discount. What we see is the sun oil premium is expected to drop back over palm towards $100. And for soy oil, sun returns to a discount on soy over the crop year. I don't even talk about rapeseed oil because of the disastrous heat surge that to really damage the Canadian prairie crop. So the good Australian crop doesn't offset the damage in Canada. But let's now turn to palm, the major oil. And I always like to look at year on year growth. I never look at monthly growth on the previous month because there's seasonality. But year on year should do away with any seasonal disruptions. And the left diagram shows you year on year growth, monthly output in Indonesia in black, and Malaysia is in green. And over the last 12 months, with one very brief exception, Malaysia has been declining, whereas Indonesia has been growing. But I thought, could some of this be due to disruption because of the pandemic? So let's do a year on two year growth comparison, which is the right diagram. So for this year, I'm comparing months in 2021 with the same month in 2019. And again, at least up until, and that's the interesting change, until May, they moved in the opposite direction. Recently, Indonesia has been growing and Malaysia has been declining. At the start of this year, declining very sharply. But what's surprising is since May, they seem to be growing in step with one another. I hadn't expected that, but that's what the numbers show. And so I asked myself, does this mean that the worst is over for Malaysia? And the answer is, I doubt it. We know that the big, big problem in Malaysia is labor. And they've announced they're going to allow in at last some foreign workers again from Indonesia and Indonesians dominate harvesters. But you must remember that already loads of Indonesians are working there and they've been unable to get out of Malaysia because of the pandemic. When the borders are open, I doubt they will be forced to stay on plantations in Malaysia. They'll be free to go and it's to be expected that many will do so. So I don't see a quick, short, sharp fix to Malaysia's labor problems for a little while. Let's now turn to what you're most interested in, which is prices. And the left diagram may come as a surprise to you. It's a price band. I love talking about price bands because I always think, and I think it's true, that thanks to biofuels, 
vegetable oils have a tie to petroleum prices. The left slide shows you the premium of Indonesian domestic CPO prices over Brent crude in dollars per ton. And look, it's a wonderful price band. Indonesians' prices have moved up, but never to $400 a ton over Brent. The price band that was tested at the top in 2016-17 is working well right now. So in Indonesia, and it's thanks to the export taxes and levies, the price band works. And the price band and the export taxes and levies are essential to keep the biodiesel mandate funded. The right slide plots in black Indonesian CPO domestic, and the green line shows you Singapore gas oil, both in dollars per ton. And the point about this is that the export levies go to the CPO fund in order to subsidize the biodiesel mandate. And biodiesel is sold in Indonesia at the Singapore gas oil price. And you will see from this diagram that the levies and export taxes have kept Indonesian CPO within a range of two to three hundred dollars above Singapore gas oil. And it's kept the biodiesel mandate functioning very effectively. When we come to look at the broader market outside Indonesia, inevitably things get a bit more complicated. I suppose first I should comment on the right slide. The right diagram shows you the premium, the spread of four prices of CPO. Green is EU, orange is FOB Southeast Asia, Blue is Malaysia, where, of course, they have to pay an export tax. And black is what I showed you before, Indonesia. Indonesia is back where the top of the price band, look at 2016-17, it's back where it was and the others were then. What has changed this time is all the others have managed to surge above the top of the price band and that the peak are somewhere near six, seven hundred dollars above crude oil. The left diagram is trying to illustrate what is important to you in India and for the world market to some extent, which is the balance between Malaysia and Indonesia in CPO exports and by implication in refined exports. What I show you there in black is what I call Indonesia's CPO export tax incentive. What do I mean? It's the difference between all the export taxes levies on Olin and on CPO. The difference being the incentive to export Olin rather than CPO. On the Malaysian side, they only have an export tax on CPO. I compare this incentive, the gap between CPO and Olin taxes, for Indonesia against Malaysia. When the export tax incentive is negative for Indonesia, meaning they have no incentive really to export CPO rather than Olin in terms of export taxes, look, the green line, which is Malaysia's share of their combined CPO exports, in that period actually went briefly above 80%. When the balance of incentives changes and Indonesia becomes more competitive in terms of export taxes as a CPO exporter and the black line goes up, the green line goes down. So when you are trying to make sense of what is going on in the market balance between the two countries, 
you've got to try to understand how the export taxes and levies are affecting refined oils as well as CPO and where the balance of advantage lies. So to conclude, what do I see for the next few months? I believe that demand rather than supply is going to be the key driver, partly because we have a pretty good idea of what supply is going to do. Thanks to Indonesia, palm output is growing, but not strongly because of past drought and also poor maintenance in terms of things like low fertilizer use. We know sun oil output is recovering, but not to the levels of two years ago, while rapeseed oil is being hit by Canada's illustration of the impact of global warming, which I think is evident elsewhere as well. Now, soy oil output, there's a lot of soy oil around the world that could be crushed, but soy oil production depends on meal demand because you don't crush beans just to store lots of meal. And the imbalance between feed wheat and feed maize, feed corn in China, led to less soy meal being needed for feed rations, and therefore China recently has had less incentive to crush beans and therefore less soy oil being obtained. Now, US and Brazil, they both can have wonderful crops, but it doesn't translate into lots more oil for export. So let's turn to demand. And what we have learned in the last two years is that except in very extreme lockdowns, as happened early last year, food demand isn't actually very sensitive to pandemics or to high prices. To be honest, the only end use that can be readily flexible is biofuel. And there have been signs of flexibility in biofuel mandates in South America. And I believe Indonesia is totally rational in supporting a rigid B30 mandate. The key to future prices lies in biofuel in the EU and US. In the US, we've seen some hesitancy over waivers, which may be a kind of indication of concerns about very high vegetable oil prices and food inflation. But also in both US and EU, and in the US I really mean California, the incentives for low carbon feedstocks provide a mechanism to reduce the use of vegetable oils in mandates. So over the next six to 12 months, I expect a gentle easing of vegetable oil prices, but only gentle. And barring macroeconomic contagion, from China's huge debt bubble and the growing worries about raw material cost inflation worldwide. There may well be contagion because when it comes, it's very hard to predict. But if there isn't contagion, I don't think the fall in prices will be dramatic. And BMD, I expect to average slightly below 4,000 ringgit next year. So. Thank you very much indeed, and I hope the rest of the conference is very successful.